and welcome back to the Wild West Crypto Show. Again, it's Brent Bates here. Drew is ill, but we got Ronnie Moez sporting the uh, black cowboy hat. And I'll tell you what, we've got the, probably one of the most important people here with us tonight, and, and that is the head of Hawk itself. Oh, no, I am not the head of Hawk. Not the head I of Hawk. a part of our communications department. Okay. Stepping in to represent us tonight. All right, well, good. Then tell everybody exactly who you are. So I am Alex Grandstaff, and I am the Senior Communications Coordinator for the Houston Area Women's Center. And we serve survivors of domestic and sexual violence throughout Houston through shelter, counseling, and advocacy. Shelter, counseling, and advocacy. That's wonderful. And I imagine that uh, you all stay busy. Unfortunately, yes. Yes. Until it stops, we're here. Well, and unfortunately, you know, there's probably never going to be a stop, which is the sad part of life. But uh, tell me, how many people do you help? We help now, it, it obviously fluctuates sure. year after year, but I just finished up doing our 2017 annual report. Okay. And we reached 93,000 Houstonians in 2017. Wow, 93,000 yeah. folks, you know. And I mean, there's a lot of parts of the country that they kind of call the flyover nation meaning they're not on the East Coast or the West Coast, yeah. they're kind of out there in the middle. And you know what? Most of the towns aren't even 93,000. Um, it's amazing the size of the population that you all help. Well, let me ask you a question. How did you all get affiliated with the Tour de Crypto? So it's actually one of those interesting stories of, so Blake Rizzo is a personal friend of my boss, Chad okay. Wren, who is our marketing and development director. All right. And when Tour de Crypto was looking around, trying to figure out, we want to support some charities, they're asking and asking, and everyone's kind of turning them away from the door. And then Blake reached out to Chow about it, and she, of course, she's always about trying to support um, our chief programming, sure. chief programming officer, sure. Sonia Corrales, says, no money, no mission. <laughs> so we need that support from our community and our country. And so she brought it before the board and they looked it over with this like fine tooth comb of what is this, what's right. cryptocurrency, we haven't heard of this. And they decided, all right, it's safe. We want to try it. So that's how it, we got now, involved. And we've been I, I so got happy a, about I it. I got a question. I don't want to get political, but uh -huh. is it, did you, they said that after the Kavanaugh hearings a couple of weeks ago, yeah. that there was a spike in phone calls to these hotlines. Did you, did you see that on your end as well? Yes. Unfortunately, when a high profile case makes the news, it creates a situation where oftentimes survivors might be re-traumatized by watching someone else go through what they've gone through, by hearing testimonies that remind them of their experiences. And so yes, when the Kavanaugh hearings happened, we saw a large spike in our hotline calls during that time. Did it come down a little bit the last few days? I don't have that exact information, oh. so I can't give but you that But there definitely one. was a spike but, uh, last yes, month. Our sec we have two hotlines. We have a domestic violence hotline and a sexual assault hotline, and our sexual assault hotline did see an increase uh -huh. that went up to double typical calls in the span of that few days. Yeah, you know, and, I, and I can attest to that. I have a, a family member that, that, because of the Kavanaugh hearings, was doing a lot of posting about her her experience yeah. and unfortunately you know she was never uh, she was never believed she was never given her day in court of sorts um, and in fact you know when she finally did get in front of authorities um, uh, it ended up with a disastrous result which uh, has kind of embittered her quite a bit uh, toward toward police and and all of that so I can I can imagine that you did get a, a spike in in that let me ask you a question uh, um, and I'm sorry to interrupt you but go ahead I'm filling in for his sidekick mm -hmm. Drew right now and Drew mentions all the time that he comes from a family of seven boys yes and his mom was abused for yes. how many years by the father uh, a long time I forget yeah. but it, it was one of those kind of things they didn't know until until much later uh, and when they found it out I, I also would um, I ran or, or was on the board of a Hill Country Youth Ranch which is in yeah. in Kerrville that takes in uh, abused wards of the state basically for lack of a better description um, and you know I imagine that you get a lot of women and kids yes. how, how difficult is it dealing with the the woman there and still the nucleus family you have the woman who more than likely is the is the one that's abused although sometimes the kids are involved as well yeah um, but I imagine that gives you a real unique challenge and one that 
some of the funding from the Tour de Crypto is going to be able to help with. Yes, actually that's why we don't, it's one of the things we try and explain a lot in the community is we don't just serve women. I right. know our name says Houston Air Women's Center, but sure. we serve men, women, children, anybody who's experienced domestic or sexual violence. Right. We have counseling programs for the kids, and we also have a 120 bed shelter in a non-disclosed location that is for mothers and children. And it's meant to provide this safe space because the thing about whether you are witnessing domestic violence as right. a child, or perhaps that abuse is also you are coming to you too directly. There is that heat they have to have that healing space from trauma. And so our shelter provides childcare, wraparound services, so that the moms and the kids both have this opportunity to truly heal right. and rebuild their lives from violence. And by I'm sorry. by wraparound services you're probably talking about some uh, uh, not psychiatric help, but actually some uh, some psychiatric, but also caseworkers and social yes. workers and uh, therapists counseling, and counselors. Helping them find career, like right. helping them find career placement. There is actually an HISD school right. on the shelter campus. Oh, really? Yes, okay. It's a small school for elementary. Okay. And so that way, if some of the kids, you know, when you're displaced like oh, that, yeah. and you're fleeing from violence. They can be in that school if they oh, yeah. need to. Well, I imagine that school is very important because while I was on the board at the youth ranch, I actually spearheaded and, and was uh, fortunate enough to be the, the signatory of us starting charter schools. And and they did, I mean, they did fantastic. I imagine having that school on site gives those kids a comfort and ability to heal quicker because they're right there. You know, they're not in the main population and you're able to work with them more closely. Can you talk for a minute, can you talk for a minute on how the counseling towards a five or a six year old differs from the counseling you would be giving to someone that's 10 or 12 or 14 years old? So I can't speak exactly to those nuances. Right. I'm not, since I don't work at I'm direct sorry. services. No, it can't. It is, in fact, still different. Like, though. is there an like, age where there's irreversible damage done to the child? Or oh, no, no. See, that, that's one of the incredible things, and it's one of the things we really try and emphasize, is that, especially in children, resilience is such oh, yeah. a powerful thing. Oh, yeah. So if you give a child the services that they need, and you give, what, the thing we try and explain is we aren't saving anything. Anybody. We are giving them the tools they need to save themselves, to build their lives free from violence. And those kids, like, there's never a point where children are irreparably damaged by violence. That as long as you give them that opportunity to feel safe, to feel heard, and to understand what happened to them, and understand that it is not their fault, and they don't have to deal with that alone. Is it easier to deal with a six year old or a 12 year old? That one I definitely can't it, it, speak to. Oh, it depends okay. on the my, child. Yeah, my, my experience of 20 years on the board that I was on, what you'll find is, is that different ages, you can reach different ages in different methods, okay? Um, and and some are, are more into the arts and some are more into the physicality of this, that, or the other thing. But each one of them is on their very own unique path. And one of the bones that I got to pick with uh, CPS in the state of Texas is that they would take about 20% of our kids and I'll tell you how old I've been in it uh, the rating system was six which is you know almost a straitjacket all the way to one which is ready to, to go wherever they want to go okay now the states changed that so that they could screw you out of some money over the last number of years but we would take somebody from a six get them to a two or a three they would be well adjusted they'd be doing great in school and then the state would come get them from us and take them to a foster home usually in a trailer park somewhere with a couple that was raising kids for a living and under the auspices of we're taking them to a family when they were living in a camp at the headwaters of the Frio River outside of Lakey, Texas in a $350,000 house with uh, 10 bedrooms and two house parents and all of a sudden they go from that environment to there because the governments thought it or the CPS it was fashionable and wanting to acclimate them into foster care and then usually we would get the kids three years later and they'd gone back to a six from a two because of, of the trauma that the state imparted on them and so it's a very it's a very difficult uh, dynamic of 
nurturing and helping these kids. It sounds like you all are doing a great job, you know, here within Houston, which I would think, you know, we're out in a rural setting, you know, I would think it's extra hard in the city. Well, the thing is, domestic and sexual violence happen everywhere. Oh, sure. And it's the, for, I think the challenge that we experience is that we actually serve the major Houston metropolitan area. So yeah. it's that massive oh, yeah. sprawl on the map. <laughs> and it's that, it's, that, it's that gridlock that starts about yes. 20 miles that side of Katy <laughs> coming in. And it's the population in. being so dense yeah. that we, are, we do, in fact, partner with a number of other organizations, including like the we our, um, our hotline advocates. When they get a call up, they do, they do coordinate with the other shelters right. in the area to see. Because if someone's way up closer to Fort Bend, right. we don't want them to have to come all the way down here, especially if they currently have employment. Sure. Because sure. it's that thing of financial independence is right. so integral. Right. So we don't want them to be completely uprooted if there's a bed up in Fort Bend that they and their kids can get to. Right. Is there a... I understand that you shelter around 2,000 people mm -hmm. uh, during the course of the year. The and that you have 120 beds and it's yes. easy to crunch the numbers. The average person is staying with you for two or three weeks. Yeah. My question is, is there a cap on how long someone can stay with you? No, we try, um, our shelter, our shelter staff are incredible people. And so oftentimes if a survivor uh, has a situation where they need an extension, we're not going to throw a survivor out if we can absolutely avoid it. Our shelter staff always do their best of if there's a situation where someone needs to stay longer, they're going to figure it out as best as they possibly can to minimize that situation where someone's going to have to leave and not have somewhere to go. Yeah, and I want to tell the people watching sure. the program that Hawk is a five-star charity that was established in 1977, and half of the seven million dollars. He's an analyst by trade, in case you can't figure it out. Half of the seven million dollars <laughs> that they have in right. expenses every year right. is covered by a government grant. Oh, wonderful! The government does, doesn't just hand out checks of three or four million dollars a year to every nonprofit. No, no, no. This charity was vetted, and they're serving a really important need. Well, let, me, let me ask you an interesting question, yeah. and, and that's and those are great facts, which you know speaks well. There's a lot of people are hesitant to give money to charities, but this is a charity oh, yeah. that was vetted, oh, yeah. as is evidenced by the fact that the government's giving well, them half of their... You know, it's obvious your money's, your money's going to be served well with these folks. Why do you think so many other people didn't vet the crypto, tour to crypto, and, and take up their offer? Well, I think it's one of those things of nonprofits, the way we're working, we're always having to go. We're right. always trying to figure out, all right, we got to make sure, yeah. we have to make sure our funding is there. We have to make sure it's stable because if, some, if we make a bad, like, funding choice, right. it's not going to impact our agency. It's going to impact people we sure. serve. And sure. so that is always at the core sure. of any nonprofit. And so I think it's that thing of, you don't understand what it is. Yeah. And maybe you don't have time to, to like, figure it there out. and be like, what is this? And is it dangerous? I got a great answer for you. All right, what is it? You used to be a stockbroker, right? Sure. You remember what they used to say in your business 20, 30 years ago? Right. You can't get fired if you put one of your clients in Microsoft. Yes, yes. That's the problem that a lot of these CEOs sure. of the charities are dealing with. They don't want to get fired because they got associated with a, yeah. a crap coin. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. But if you wait until one of the major charities yeah. like Red Cross or UNICEF or United yeah. Way goes into crypto, then you could say, I was just following their lead yeah. because we didn't want them to get an edge on us in the fundraising race. Yes. So they're in a way pioneers. They're one of the first ones to well, accept this. And that's why that's part of what the lead of the question was is, is to kind of tip my hat to you all for being smart enough to go look into it and figure out that you know this crypto stuff is for real you know that, that there's some real credible people behind this one of them sitting to your left and that it would certainly be something that would be beneficial for the charity but most certainly beneficial for the women throughout the, the city of Houston and the greater Houston metropolitan and, area. And charities are historically conservative by nature. Sure. And there's resistance to change. You yep. can't teach an old dog new no, tricks. No. no, no. If there's an old person sitting at the head of a charity, right. they're going to be a lot less likely to embrace a crypto donation sure. than someone who is half his age. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Or her well, age. Well, listen, I, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for the commitment that you all have. I want to thank you for the work that you do. And, uh, and I certainly uh, wish the best for you. 
and your organization. And hopefully, folks, uh, get involved with the Tour de Crypto and uh, send some money their, their way uh, through this organization. So what's the website for the tour? Uh, well, they can go to hawk.org yeah. backslash Tour de Crypto. Okay. Or they can just go to tourdecrypto.com. Find it either way. And Hawk is spelled H A W C. Right. Dot H A W C. Not like org. the bird. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We'll be back in two minutes here at the Wild West Crypto Show.